My name is Donald Clark, originally from Oklahoma, a small town in Oklahoma. And uh, I was born in 1932, so uh, I've been around for a while. Uh, the, uh, I left Clayton, where I was born, a little small town southeastern Oklahoma, when I uh, joined the Army in, 19, in March of 1951. Uh, at that time, there was an option open for uh, taking uh, basic training in Hawaii, at Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Uh, so the fellow in front of me in the line and the fellow behind me looked up on the wall, and here was this poster, which said, and of course there were palm trees and uh, the beautiful view of the ocean, the beach, and enlist for Hawaii. Well, I, one of the guys said, I'll do it if you do it, this kind of thing. So uh, here we go. Okay, the three of us decided, okay, we'll do it. I'd never met these fellows before they had, and, uh, but and nevertheless, we, we joined up with that option. We were regular army infantry and going through infantry basic in Schofield at, in Hawaii. So uh, we got to Hawaii. Well, we went first to San Antonio reception station. They further shipped us on a troop train out to, uh, out to uh, San Francisco, where we boarded a ship uh, by the name of USS Pickaway. And it certainly Pickaway, five days to get to Hawaii. And, uh, but when we finally got there, of course the, we docked, and here's the hula girls, and the band playing and everything, and I looked at the fellow on my right and my left, and the same fellows. I said, well, this is not going to be bad at all. And until we got to Schofield, and then it was 14 weeks of hell till getting us ready for, uh, for Korea. Even though they never, they, they, they promised us, or said anyway, they didn't promise but they said, no, this is not a stepping stone to Korea, but it was. And the general let us know right away when we got there, or should I say the colonel in charge of the battalion. And uh, so we went into training with the knowledge that we were going to go over as, as uh, uh, go over to Korea as infantry. And uh, so we went through and then graduated from basic, and uh, then got on another ship and went to Japan to the uh, Camp Drake Replacement Depot. Depot. At the Repel Depot, uh, every day we would gather out in, a, in the front of the barracks that they'd placed us in, and the sergeant would come out with his clipboard. There was a great huge rock sitting in front of the barracks. And he even had a ladder to climb up on the block. So that, and he'd get up on the, on the top of the rock and then he would begin calling out names. Seventh Division, so-and-so, so-and-so names. Uh, Third Infantry Division, so-and-so names, and kept going on through. There were 1,700 of us gathered around the rock at the beginning. Well, it kept decreasing and decreasing each day until the final day, and they called out the final infantry replacements, and there was 34 of us left. Of the 34, uh, uh, I didn't notice them being any different than anyone else. It was just luck of the draw, I suppose. But they, the sergeant said, you're going to Etajima Specialist School 
to train as a radio operator. We need radio operators in Korea. And uh, so we looked at each other and, and well, okay. So we went through something like 12 weeks, right about 12 weeks of uh, code training. And uh, then a sergeant from Korea came to my class and he said, we're in dire need right now of uh, radio operators, that is trained radio operators in CW, continuous wave radio, uh, who can operate our ANGRC 26, Angry 26 we call it, the Angry 26 radio truck. And uh, we are, uh, uh, we have teams all over Korea at all the air bases as well as with the American divisions, American units, and the ROK, the ROC units also. And uh, the, uh, uh, we'll be handling close air support for whatever unit we are assigned to. We'll be sending messages for them, ordering close air support for, for the unit. And uh, so we spent three weeks more in Etajima, training on the Angry 26. And then we in mass got on a ferry, went across to Pusan. Of course, at that time, the, 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 uh, the line had more or less stabilized up north. And uh, so we, uh, we got into Pusan, overnight ferry, and then uh, they put us on a train, took us to Seoul, and we went to the compound in Seoul and they bedded us down. And uh, then the next day we were assigned to different units. Well, my assignment was to remain in Seoul at the headquarters uh, communicating for 8th Army. What was the date again that you arrived in Korea? Uh, this was uh, in November of 51. November 51. Uh, Yes, November 51. And uh, I came in the Army in March of 51 and then had the training and then arrived in Korea in November of 51. Well, at that time, uh, uh, I, I had a desire to uh, get into a what they call a four-point zone. That is, the, the zone of uh, Korea was established on certain certain lines, certain zones, or certain units. If you were assigned to a combat unit or a unit on the line, then you could get four points. If you were behind the line, you get three points. If you're back in Seoul and Pusan, you get you get two points a month. So, and of course, the allotment I think was something like 44 or 48 points before you could rotate. So, I decided well. That I want to go up in a four-point zone. And uh, so I applied to the company commander, and, uh, and he sent me on the next, trap, next truck. I was assigned to uh, one of the uh, rock units, uh, the second rock core, which had the, uh, the sixth rock, the capital rock, and the third rock divisions under it. This was in the center part of the line. Uh, I don't know if you can you be able to see this on the map. But here's the black line, the line at the time that I was there. In this area right here in the center part is the uh, is the area where they, they sent me. Our job was to uh, to send messages ordering TOTs, or time on targets, target missions for the Air Force to come in and, and bomb or strafe, strafe the line. Uh, the sequence would be 
the commander on the ground in the rock unit would would uh, uh, he would require a a mission. We had an officer there that uh, decided yes, this was official. This was an American officer, and uh, he uh, and then he would send the message to us, and uh, we would uh, then transmit it on back to. Joint Operations Center, JOC in Seoul, who then would in turn send it to the Air Force Base, and they'd order out a flight of of uh, of fighters to that particular area. They would come in, and the TOT, the time on target, was an established time because we knew exactly how long it would take for us to be able to transmit all this through the sequence. We'd done it time and time again. So uh, it was very fast, and uh, there was a what we called a mosquito plane, which was nothing more than a Piper Cub Cessna type small airplane, piloted by a an air observer, foreign uh, uh, artillery, or rather a, an air observer, uh, to direct the flight into the particular target that was that required in that mission. And the mosquito plane then would, uh, he would receive the flight, they would communicate, and he would tell them where the target is and sometimes put a, put smoke on the target if, they, if it wasn't too apparent. A particular mountain, a particular fortification or something of this sort that was giving the rocks problems or maybe it was an attack on a particular position and they wanted a mission in that situation. So, uh, and then after the action is over, the Mosquito pilot had released the fighters and they'd gone back. He in turn transmitted uh, his observation to the American officer, the, the uh, air officer, that, uh, uh, and he would prepare an after action report and we would communicate that back down to Joint Operations Center as to what what transpired and uh, what the estimates were for the uh, the damage estimates etc and uh, that was basically it uh, this went on time and time and time again and uh, uh, I don't remember too much about the particular battles that was fought in my area I do remember one I seem to recall that it was Capitol Hill, uh, and I, I've forgotten what division's area that was in. I believe it was the 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 uh, Sixth Rock Division in their area, and we kept pushing them off, and they kept pushing us off, and and things like that, and and, and uh, to the point to where it was very difficult to uh, uh, to maintain. So, and we. We put a lot of effort into trying to keep that that particular hill. It was for strategic purposes, tactical purposes, actually. And uh, so, my uh, my radio team consisted of some. Hmm, we had three operators: a radio repairman. Uh, a team chief, and we had a, a squad tent, uh, which we we lived in, and it, this was the, the all mounted on a two and a half, a two and a half ton truck, uh, along with a power generator hooked onto the back, and we would travel different places and dig in, and uh, uh, we didn't travel too awful much, didn't have to move our position too much. I recall one time that uh, we had set up beside a particular river. I've forgotten the name of the river now. Uh, I know I can't remember it. Anyway, uh, either we or the the Chinese at the time had knocked out any bridges that, that were on that river except one. Unfortunately, uh, we set up our our truck, 
our position near that bridge. And they kept lobbing in shells and trying, trying to knock out that bridge. And uh, so I recall that that was one of the times that uh, we, we moved rather quickly and got out of there and moved to another position. And uh, that was about the closest thing I came to in the way of, uh, way of combat. And uh, that was on the receiving end. So uh, uh, what I basically did was send messages. And uh, at the end of the, uh, the, at the end of the tour, uh, I forget, let's see, I left there in, well, a year later. I believe it was either November or December, I forget, of 52. I left there and rotated to Japan. And I was on my first three-year enlistment at the time. And so I said <coughs> I wanted to spend my last year in Japan as opposed to uh, rotating back to the States. And uh, so I spent that tour in Japan for one year. And uh, then I got back to, uh, to the U.S. I was out for a little while, out of the Army for a little while, and then came back in. And eventually uh, uh, spent 23 years and retired from the Army. Uh, when I went to Korea, I, of course, was a private. When I left Korea, I, uh, I was a corporal. And I made sergeant, three-stripe sergeant, uh, the equivalent today anyway, uh, E-5. Uh, I made that in, in Japan, that one-year tour. So when I decided to come back in, it was within 90 days, so I was able to retain my rank. And uh, from there on, spent 23 years. Uh, I got promotions on up to E-7. And then uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to uh, receive a warrant. I was a warrant officer. And uh, I stayed in that position for maybe a year, two years, something like that. And uh, then got a direct commission to first lieutenant. And, and I retired as a major. What uh, unit were you a part of while you were in Oh, I forgot that. The Air Ground Liaison Company, 8075th Army Unit. It was a unique operation because... In Second World War, the, uh, the Marines had their own Air Force and their own close air support. When they, when they went on an amphibious landing, they had the airplanes and the, to the wherewithal to uh, strafe and, and take care of their own. And they had their own communications and their own, everything was self-contained. Uh, they proved that it could do it. They could, they could do it. The Army did not have that. Every time anybody wanted anything in the Army, for the Army, uh, it was go through a hell of a procedure trying to, trying to get, some, get some air support. Anyway, in Korea, they came up with the idea that, that we should have teams with the major units all over Korea and provide that close air support. And on a on a very very quick basis, I forget how how long it took us to uh, from the time we received the order till till the flight was actually uh, leaving the air base. And the air base might be any air base in Korea. Whoever whoever was closer or had the fighters available, that that's the one that they sent. And they would come back and tell us what time they're going to be on target. And our mosquito pilot then would be there to, uh, to receive them and direct them onto the target. Now that's basically what the Marines do. 
and they did it back in the Second World War, but the Army did not. We didn't do it until Korea. And, uh, uh, but we were doing it inter-service from Army using Air Force planes, Air Force pilots, whereas the Marines, they controlled everybody that was in the, in the, in the operation. They were a Marine, air or on ground. So it was different that way. We had to coordinate with the Air Force and, and uh, set up a system in which uh, there would be speed and uh, the, it was a necessity as soon as we got the order to get that message onto the air base and, and uh, the, fly, the fighters then go into the area directed by the mosquito and knock out that particular target. So sometimes it was attacks. So an attack, you need it now when, the, when it's called for. Can you tell me more about what your duties looked like while you were there? We, we had three or sometimes we had four operators, radio operators, and we would take shifts 24 hours a day in the, in the radio truck. Uh, both receiving messages and sending messages. And of course, in the winter time, it was warmer than our tent. Uh, so everybody fought for the midnight shift uh, because you could stay warm all night right there in the, in the, in the hut because the transmitter was about the size of a Hmm. Uh, a, sp uh, a refrigerator, and uh, I can remember the nom nomenclature. BC ten was the the, the transmitter, and uh, uh, and of course we had receivers and and uh, all kinds of other equipment in there that was how uh, that was creating heat, and didn't have to have a didn't have to have a heater, so you, you stay warm. But in the tent, no. We had a pot-bellied stove, and it would get roaring red in the evenings at night. And you'd really have to, uh, in North Korea, you really have to circle that tent, that, that stove, and get close to it to stay warm. And then you only bake one side, and through, pretty soon you got to turn the cake over, and uh, and get the other side warm too. So uh, I do remember the cold of that first winter. Uh, I left before the second winter got too bad, and uh, uh, I recall that. Uh, in November, when we finally got into uh, into Seoul, we joined the the company in Seoul uh, from from Japan, from school. Uh, it was something like around three or four o'clock in the afternoon when we arrived at the company. They put us into a a building that. Uh, it's hard to call it a barracks because you could see outside. The, the boards on the walls were like this and there was no insulation, no nothing. Just, just some boards stuck in a stick up there. So they gave us a bunch of cardboard boxes and uh, said, if you want to sleep as warm as you can tonight, then you'll get those, those openings in the walls covered up to keep the wind out. And uh, this was November, so it wasn't the worst part, but it was cold. And uh, so we went to work cutting down these big cardboard boxes and tacking them up on the walls all over the barrack until, until we got enough, uh, until we got it covered. And, uh, and then we slept that night. Of course, you sleep in, uh, mountain sleeping bags. And uh, you could stay reasonably warm with, with a mountain sleeping bag. But uh, uh, 
I do recall the coldness, and of course the heat in the in the summer is something else. Uh, I remember we used to enjoy uh, showers now and then. There'd be a shower truck come through. We were kind of satellited on a on an artillery unit that wasn't too awfully far from us that we could go to and once in a while get an American meal. Otherwise, we were eating rations that we would bring from Seoul, and uh, depending on upon our position. But I recall in the summertime, uh, once in a while they'd have a shower truck and uh, come around. And of course, there's about three or four showers on each side of the of the tank. And uh, here'd be a bunch of guys stripped off naked, out in the out in the open completely, taking showers. And uh, that was the only time that you got to got to clean yourself, so to speak. And uh, uh, of course, that was we didn't expect to be in the hotel accommodations. Uh, but uh, it was a welcome sight when the when we saw the sh the shower truck coming by on the road. We'd flag them down and take a shower. And uh, otherwise, it was out of your helmet. And uh, we would make what we call beer runs to Seoul, uh, back to the company headquarters, and we'd get rations. And uh, each man got beer rations also, and cigarette rations. Used to think it was terrible to had to buy a pack of cigarettes. Uh, uh, I think they were around 10 cents a pack back in those days. A dollar, 90 cents maybe in the PX uh, for a, a carton of cigarettes, 10 packs. Well, we got them free. They would either be Lucky Strike, Camel, or Chesterfield. That's the ones I remember. You just took your chances as to which, which uh, brand you got. But for the people that didn't smoke, they would pass it on. And uh, uh, so that was one thing. And of course, we'd on these beer runs, we'd go down and have to spend the night. We'd spend the night down, down in Seoul. And this was different guys on the team would make the run. Two men would go down to make the, make the run. And usually it'd be the shift operators because they'd, they'd be the ones that are free. It's pretty hard to let your radio man, radio repairman go if something broke down. You wouldn't have communications. So he didn't get to go very often. What kind of friendships or camaraderie did you build? Hardly any. Uh, we were real close-knit while we were in Korea. But once we left Korea, I never saw these guys again. On my, on my team. Uh, that was the problem with the system of uh, repo levels, replacements, individual replacements. Since then, they've gotten a little smarter, I think. And, uh, for example, in the Iraq War, they, uh, they uh, send units where the guy on the right and the guy on the left is the same guy that would, you went you went through training with. You know his capabilities, and uh, you can depend on him or you cannot depend on him. You know, you know what the, it's, it's just a much better system. But back in those days in Korea, we, uh, we were individualized. Oh, you, you made friends while you were in Korea, but there wasn't, you didn't see him again after that, or I didn't. Uh, now, after I left Korea, uh, and got assignments various places. Of course, you establish uh, friendships then that's, that are lasting, that, uh, that go from country to country of uh, uh, assignment to assignment. And uh, you may run, in, every assignment you run into, you run into somebody that you knew before at some other assignment. It's, the Army is kind of close-knit that way. And uh, so it was a pleasure that way. But in Korea, I think the, the fault was the replacement system, the individual replacement system. You just couldn't, 
you couldn't establish uh, long-lasting friendships. And as I understand it, in the, in the infantry, uh, they didn't want to get too close. But uh, that wasn't my situation. And uh, I remember a couple of the names, uh, a fellow named Bocini, that uh, was one of our operators. And uh, uh, that's about it. And as far as the names I can remember, that's only been, what, 60-odd hmm, years, something like that. A uh, little difficult to remember such things as that. What was the date that you rotated home? Uh, you mean from Japan? Uh, or from Korea? Yeah, when did you leave Korea and then when did you rotate from Japan? Uh, one year later. I left at Korea in November of of 52 and then stayed until uh, Oh, it was longer than a year. Yeah, because I, I came in in March of 51, so I was discharged in March of 54. So it was after the, after, I must have stayed in Japan maybe 13, 14, 15 months, something like that. Uh, when you got home, what was the reception like? No reception. I, uh, we, uh, it was by ship coming back, and we docked in Washington State. Uh, I don't remember the post. It was Washington State. And then we were put on a, on a train to go to Fort Carson, Colorado, to be discharged. And uh, I remember uh, in uh, Great Falls, Montana, uh, they stopped the train and uh, they said they're going to, they had some weather or something had stopped it and they were gonna be there for a few hours so they let us off the train. Well, me and some buddies, we got we have to go to get a get a beer down in down in Great Falls, and so uh, about the best thing I can remember about that situation was the guy I went with to get a beer. I never knew him before, but he met everybody. Everybody he met, he wanted to call him Sam. And he'd go into the bar, hello Sam, and so and so on. And everything was Sam for some reason, and that stuck with me for all this time. And I remember him for that, for that thing. That's rather unusual to meet someone that has that kind of approach to people that he doesn't know at all. He just calls them Sam, and that was it. Uh, so we got to Fort Carson, got uh, discharged. Then I made it back to Oklahoma to my mother and my brother. And uh, uh, I was completely undecided about what to do at that time. And uh, so uh, I thought about going back to school, going on to the university. But uh, uh, that wasn't appetizing to me. And before my 90 days were up, I was at the recruiting office again, signing up for another three years. And I also did it on my sixth year. I did the same thing, I got out, messed around for a while, a few weeks, still can't decide whether to stay in the Army or make it some other way. And uh, I ultimately decided to stay in the Army. And then from then on, there was no question that uh, and I liked it. I liked the regimen of it. I liked the people talk about, oh, Miss Hall, chow. 
you don't want to eat that army food. I, mean, I, I loved it. I thought it was, it was a heck of a lot better than I got when I was growing up, except my mother was a very good cook. But we came from a very poor family. And uh, uh, we were lucky to get food, period. And uh, my father died when I was eight years old. So it fell to my mother to, to raise the children. And uh, so a penny was, was conserved as much as you could insofar as food's concerned. And uh, so anyway, I loved it. I thought it was great. I remember the first meal in San Antonio at the reception station. When we got there, they took us over to the mess hall. It was around, around uh, supper time, and they had liver and onions. I'd never eaten liver and onions before. And, uh, and I, thought, I thought it was pretty good, strangely enough. You don't, you don't think about something like that, as, uh, but it's something that stuck with me. And uh, of course, there at the reception station, they, uh, uh, they give you a haircut, the normal things, the haircut, a flying 20 uh, for cosmetics. You know what I'm talking about by flying 20? Okay, well, you don't have any money or they can't count on everybody, 100% of the people, having money in their pocket, in their wallet. So you're authorized to take $20 from advance pay. And that'll take care of buying cigarettes and buying cosmetics or toilet articles and things like that so that you can present yourself properly. And uh, so we got the, the Flying 20. And uh, I remember one guy... Oh, they must have pulled this trick. This, it wasn't a trick. It was a profession, a profession. Two sergeants came into our barracks. Of course, we'd only, only been in the Army about three days. We were in the process of getting the haircuts and the flying 20 and the different things that you, you get when you, uniforms, etc. And So it was in the evening hours, and we'd all settled down in the, in the, in the barracks. And uh, here comes two sergeants, and they want everybody to gather, gather around. And now, here is what you're going to face when you get in when you're in the army. You want to stay out of trouble. You want to make sure that one small thing doesn't lead to more things. So take care of all your small things all the details. Be especially careful of your brass on your collars. The copper looking brass that they wear. Enlisted men. Of course, we were all young, 18 years old type things. and they, All of them regular army, just, just off the farm, so to speak. And uh, so Come to find out what they're selling. He was selling, it looked like a cigarette paper, which in a little book of paper, little tissues. And this might have had 25, 30 sheets of this tissue in this little, about the size of a cigarette for rolling cigarettes. But in each of these little pieces of the paper was two little holes. And those two little holes is where the hole on your brass go when you take it through and clip it on the underside. I said, now you put this up there on your shirt collar and it'll fit right on with the uniform and you put it there and you stick the brass right through those two holes, you're going to get it correct every time. He was only sell, selling them for a dollar. I think it was a dollar. So it was cheap from that standpoint. We had that flying 20 in our, in our pocket and burning a hole, so to speak. And nobody wanted to get in trouble, all of us regular army. So we didn't want to get in trouble from the start off. So many of the guys bought these $1 cigarette, cigarette papers, 
to take care of that, take care of the brass, make sure it was put on properly. It's a scam, as taking advantage of young guys, but that's, I remember that distinctly. I didn't buy it, luckily. But uh, I wouldn't admit to it anyway. <laughs> what is Korea to you now? Remarkable. Uh, was it last year? I think so. Last year I went on the revisit program uh, to Korea and uh, and also took a uh, five-day trip to Beijing. And uh, when I when I saw Korea today, it was just uh, completely foreign to what I'd been accustomed to. I, uh, uh, for example, the city of Chuncheon. Uh, when I was there, we passed through, and it was nothing but rubble, nothing but rubble. I, I remember a, a column sticking up out of the ground, concrete column, where it was a corner, just sticking up with nothing else, nothing else attached to it, just a concrete column was sticking up out of the ground, and that was the only thing that was left. And uh, you look around, and that's that's all that was there. And uh, people were living in in caves. Uh, dug out on the side of the mountain. Uh, funny thing, you know, when I was up there, and then, of course in Seoul it might have been different. I don't, I don't remember any, but I never heard a dog bark. And now that that to me. Uh, I thought about it later and said, well, they're just, they're not available because they've been eaten. And uh, the civilians, they were in real, real bad shape, the refugees. Uh, they simply don't, uh, uh, they're just not built for that kind of situation that they they faced, that they were in. And uh, uh, very seldom would you see any kind of town or city once in a while. Further, the further south you get on the main, on the MSR, the main supply route, uh, then the more people you would see and the more uh, inhabitable houses and to some, some degree would be. But uh, uh, on further up north, no, almost nothing. <laughs> 